bounce it out. Good morning. Hello, hello. Welcome to Fairfield First Baptist Church. It is good to see everyone today. I uh, had a, we had a big week here at the church, a sports camp. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who helped, all the students, all the adults. Uh, we had an awesome week at camp. Man, it was just fantastic. And so we wanted to start off the service by giving you a little taste of camp if you weren't here. And so we made a little slideshow so you can cue it up. The theme of the camp was uh, the wild, wild west. So I think you'll kind of catch on as you, as you watch. worship yeah I think the last day we had our closing celebration we invite the parents to come and we had a lot of parents show up I feel like we maxed out the fire code in the rock it was <laughs> packed it was packed it was awesome so let me pray before we sing Lord we thank you for such a full week um, such a great week and I pray that you would help us to rest and re-energize for this next week ahead 
um, as we get ready to worship you this morning. I pray that you would be here with your spirit and we could worship you as a church together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for wanting to use us um, to do your purposes and to spread your word on this earth. And I pray that you would strengthen the church as we meet together, um, that you would help us to draw closer to you, that your spirit would be here and we would leave here fully charged and just full uh, from your presence and from being with your people, ready to take on another week in this world, whatever it may bring us this week. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be with us um, and that we would um, be following you in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for um, the tithes and the offerings given. I pray that they would be used for your kingdom. And I thank you for Pastor Tim, and I pray for him this morning as he brings your word, that you would fill him with your spirit and preach truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, children. It is time for Children's Church. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Brian, praise team. Thank you for such a great week of sports camp. It was uh, almost trouble-free. I mean, just a very few little instances of scrapes and scratches, but a great week. Um, I know we had uh, 170 were initially enrolled. I think we averaged over 150 to 160. That's just kids. And you saw, man, it was crazy around here. I guess I'm getting old because it bothers me a little bit more than it used to. But, um, I mean, to see our fellowship hall and be in a hockey field and, and the races going up and down the hallways, and whew, glad it's over. Glad it's over. But a great week. Thank you all that helped out. A lot of adults helped out as well. And you young people did fantastic. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So one of the purposes of the Bible is to give an, us encouragement in a very discouraging world. In fact, the Greek word used for encouragement is parakaleo, parakaleo, and it actually simply means to strongly encourage. Last Sunday, we examined what I consider to be one of the most discouraging events or things in our lives, and that is death, the death of particularly of our loved ones. And ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, everyone born in this world has surely died. That is, if they are not here today. Now, there have been, of course, a couple of exceptions. And that is uh, in way back in the Old Testament, there was a man named Enoch. Do y'all remember about Enoch? And he was such a godly man. He walked with God, the Bible says. And one day um, he was, I guess, he was walking with God. And, and God says, I'm just going to take you on home. And he took him on home to heaven. So he never died. Another one that's mentioned in the Old Testament is a man named Elijah. Elijah was a prophet of God and he was such a godly man that when it was time for him to leave this earth, God sent a fiery chariot from heaven. And Elisha was there, his, his successor, and watched this fiery chariot come down. And Elijah got on the chariot and flew on to heaven in that fiery chariot. Two exceptions to the rule. Two people that have not surely died uh, that's been born in this world. However, there's going to be one group of people coming someday, maybe soon. And uh, they're not going to die. Uh, the Bible says that there's going to be one generation of believers that when Jesus comes back to this world, that they're going to be raptured. They're going to be caught up alive, transformed as they move up in the air into the new glorified bodies, and then they're going to go to heaven. Of course, I've always voted for that. That's what I would like, okay? Uh, I think it was J. Vernon McGee says that he was looking for the upper taker, not the undertaker. So that's what I'm looking for as well. So anyway, so that we know that, and that's an awesome thing to think about. But until that day comes, sad to say, all of us, if Jesus tarries, will surely die, as it says. Now, it's interesting that in the second chapter of the beginning of the Bible, God tells Adam, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, 
you shall surely die. And as I've already said, ever since that day, that's been true, okay, for all of us. But in the second chapter at the end of the Bible, which is fascinating how that works out that way, it says in the new heaven and new earth, it says, there shall be no more death. Man, that is, that is encouraging, right? The new heaven, new earth, no more death. Now, last Sunday I shared with you um, my own uh, discouraging life as far as deaths in my family and friends and, and just a, a kind of over uh, view of that personally. And even as believers, King David explains to us that we must pass through this thing called the valley of the shadow of death. And, and I shared with you, just as honest as I know how, it is heartbreaking from time to time. Um, so I also share with you there's three levels of discouragement. We talked about encouragement. That's what the Bible's about. But in this world, there's a lot of discouragement. And the first level is is simply the loss of interest. Um, I mentioned the Reds last week. I should have never mentioned the Reds. <laughs> they were doing so great. So I'm hoping I'll mention them again, maybe the second time they'll start doing it. They've been shut out the last three games since I said anything about them. So maybe I'm a curse, I don't know. Um, but it, it's a little discouraging after all the great that they were doing and now they can't even get a hit almost and, and, and much less a run. So that's one level. A second level, though, is deeper level, and that's the level we often uh, experience during a time of, of death and a loved one, and that's depression. And depression is a loss of spirit. Not only do you lose your interest in maybe a certain thing, you lose your interest in everything. It's a much deeper level. And then finally, the final level, the worst level, is despair. And that's what we'd call the loss of hope. Many of my days of depression... I've been followed by someone because of a death of a loved one. But praise be to God, as I shared last week, although we as Christians grieve, our grief is not without hope. Our grief is only temporary. God has given us the hope of a place where the, their death will lose its sting. I shared this verse last week, but let me read it again. This is in 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into the bodies that will never die... This scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And the answer is, in Jesus Christ's resurrection, it has been swallowed up in his victorious resurrection. Because we too will be raised like that. Now this morning I want to talk about another very discouraging fact about this world. In general, it's pain and suffering. I know all of us have experienced some form of pain and suffering. The longer we've been around, probably the more pain and suffering we have experienced. But what I want to do this morning is I want to zero in on, on one of the causes of much of our pain and suffering and kind of focus on that, and that's ill health. Ill health. Now, the first service this morning, I had mostly older people, and we are much more knowledgeable about this because as you get older, you get more ill health, and that's the way it goes. So I know you're younger people. So far, maybe you're thinking I had some bad things, but you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm just going to tell you, okay? <laughs> now, I shared with you last week about my uncle, my uncle Lowell, and um, he was the first death in my life. I was 13 years old, and we got the news that he had died at the age of 36 years old of a heart attack. Very devastating to my, my family, my, my mom. It was uh, her sister's husband. But I didn't tell you this about my Uncle Lowell. My Uncle Lowell had, from the time he was a teenager, the time he died, had passed over 100 kidney stones. Now, I've had a few. I've had four. I can count them because you don't remember. You don't forget those things. But I, I think back, and I didn't know this at the time, but, but he was going through these things. I know that uh, he seemed to be in pain sometimes, but I didn't know why until after he died. And then I found out that he had this very difficult journey of all these kidney stones. And, and, uh, and I thought, oh, I can imagine the pain and suffering that he endured over those many years with those kidney stones. I think it's discouraging enough to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but when you add all of our pain and suffering on top of that, it sometimes can be very, very discouraging. Now, fortunately, most of our pain and suffering with health problems is short-term, temporary. You know, you get, you maybe get a headache, it goes away in a couple of hours. Maybe you get the 24-hour bug. You get the 24, thank goodness it says 24 hours. 
I've had it a few long, longer than that, and it's not, too, not fun at all. But you know it's, okay, you're sick right now, your stomach's turning, you're throwing up, but next, the next day you're okay. Thank goodness for that, right? Or maybe you have a cold, and it goes on for a week or so, but it, you get over it. But sometimes we get sick, and it's a longer experience, especially as we get older. In fact, in some cases, our sickness actually gets to the point where it leads to death, like when my mother got liver cancer. And a few months later, she passed away. So in the first verse described in the new heaven, it says, there will be no more pain and suffering, and that means there's no more sickness. So that's great. That's awesome. Someday, we're going to have a day where we'll never get sick again. But what about the here and now? What about what we're experiencing in life today? Is there any encouragement for today as far as healing is concerned? And the answer is absolutely. Absolutely there is. And that brings me to my first question this morning, and it is, why did Jesus heal so many people? Have you ever thought about how many people he healed? I mean, we talk about it. There's one verse that kind of summarizes it. This is in uh, Matthew 4. It says that Jesus went throughout all of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every illness and disease and affliction among the people. Thousands? Tens of thousands? How many people? My question is why? Why was it so important for Jesus to heal so many people in the days that he was three years he was on this earth and ministering to people? I mean, he raised the dead. He cast out demons. He fed a whole crowd of over 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. That would have been enough to prove he was the Messiah. But Jesus went about and he healed people all over the place, all kinds of illnesses. He healed uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law. She had a fever. And uh, she was in bed, and so he, he just rebuked the fever, and it went away. That, you know, that was, she'd probably get over it pretty quick herself, but it was temporary. But what about the people he healed that had been born that way? He had a man that was born blind, and he healed that man, and he could see. He had people that were paralyzed, never being able to walk. He healed them. All these diseases. There's one woman that came to him, and she had so much faith in him, and she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed of my illness. And he, she did, and she was. And then, of course, Jesus has got all these crowd pushed. He says, who touched me? Because he felt some power come from his body as she was healed. And she says, oh, it was me. And she says, for 12 years, I've been suffering with this horrible illness. And I've used all my money to pay the doctors. And none of them could figure out and help me. And today, I've been healed by touching you. So there's all these examples. Why did Jesus do all these things? Well, I think it's because God wants us to know his plan was not just to save us from our sins, but to deliver us from all the evil that comes along with sin. And one of those evils, one of those worst evils, is sickness and pain and suffering. It has crippled, maimed, blinded, and caused all kinds of pain and suffering in our lives. But Jesus wants us to know that salvation is not just for our, um, not just for our souls. Salvation is for our bodies as well. Romans 8, verse 22. I've always loved this passage. Romans 8 is probably one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It has so much great truth, but here's something that is really amazing. Paul writes, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of of our bodies. Now, once again, you know, I'm pushing 70, a few more years. My body's groaning a little bit more than a lot of you younger people, and that's the way it works. Thank goodness for that. But as you get older, your, your body's groaning and desiring to someday be free from all of this pain and suffering that we grow through. Now, I believe that when King Jesus comes to rule and reign this world during the millennium, I personally believe that there'll be no more sickness and illnesses. If there is someone that's sick, then they obviously could go to Jesus and get healing. I know that we who are ruling with him and our new glorified bodies will be uh, sickness-free, right? No sickness at all. But what about the mortals that have entered into the millennial reign that were, you know, survived the tribulation and, and they're procreating, having children, all the children to be born during the millennium? Will they be sick as well? I don't think they will. I this is just my own personal belief, but I believe they'll also be sick free. And here's why. 
It's because I believe that when Jesus came the first time, he was revealing some of the things that were going to happen when he came the second time. That's why he healed so many people in so many different places all through Galilee. I want you to listen to how Isaiah describes the millennium when Jesus is going to rule as king of kings. It says, no more shall there be in it, that is this kingdom of God, an infant who lives but a few days. You think today of the tragedies when there's a, a child is born and there's some kind of major uh, defect that it has, birth defect or something, and, and they die in a short period of time. He says, no more of that. He goes on to say, or an old man who does not fill out his days. Now we think, old oh, man, wow, I think I'm kind of old, and maybe I go another 20 years, I'm really old, you know. Okay, now also it says, but the young man shall die a hundred years. Wow. And the sinner a hundred years shall be accursed. So think about this. In the millennium, when a person dies a hundred, at a hundred, everybody's going around saying, oh, how sad. He was so young, a hundred years old. In fact, I believe that the lifespans of people will may probably be returned to the pre-flood lifespans when people lived be a thousand years. So why was it the lifespans were so drastically different before the flood? Well, it's interesting that just in the last uh, couple weeks, we've been going back in Genesis in our Bible study at 945 in the fellowship hall. I'd really encourage you, if you want to come to something great, come to that Bible study. But Lester, who's teaching the class, gave us this little paper last week. And I know you can't sue it too well, so I'm going to, and I'm not sure how the camera's going to pick this up, but there's a straight line over about about a third of the page right here. This is before the flood, okay? Then there's this curved line that goes down like this, and that is how quickly lifespans began to drop. From the time of the flood, almost a thousand years, and then after that, it just went down fast. So why is that? Why is that? Uh, and I believe it's because after the flood, there was great climate change. Do I believe in climate change? Yes, I just believe it happened 4,000 years ago. Because there was such a drastic change that lifespans on this earth dropped significantly because of the change that was taken. It's interesting, in Genesis 8:22, right after the flood, God speaks to Noah, and he says to Noah, you know what, from now on, there's going to be summer and winter, heat and cold. In other words, the implication was before the flood, there was... Uh, the whole world was a protected place of kind of like a greenhouse effect where the temperature was probably about the same whether you lived at the North Pole, South Pole, or the equator. The whole world was probably uniform in the climate. So, and the worst thing I think that happened when this change took place in our climate was the sun's radiation began to have greater effects on our lives, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. You see, in God's original creation, we're told that God created a protective barrier around the world to protect us from the sun. It's interesting that the translators, and I'd encourage you to do this sometime, not right now, but some other time, to look up in Genesis 1 and see what it says in your translation. The King James Version says that God created these firmaments, and there was this firmament above, and there was a firmament beneath, basically around the, around the ground. So there was a firmament way up in the sky, and it's a protective barrier of some sort, and it's from it down on the ground. And they were called firmaments in the King James Version. The Hebrew word is rakia. It's R-A-Q-I-A. -A. That's the Hebrew word. Translators didn't have a clue. Many of the Bibles are translated in the last several hundred years, so they didn't have a clue of what it is. Now, it actually means, it means the vault of heaven. But what does that mean, the vault of heaven? So here are some other words that other translations use for the firmament. They use the word dome. So you can imagine a big dome around the world. You can imagine a canopy, an expanse, the horizon, vapors, and an open space. Now, you put all those words, those, those things all mean different things. So it's, it's obvious they don't really know what this is, okay? They had a tough time describing it. But I think the answer found in what had happened here to cause the world to be totally flooded is actually found in Genesis 7:11. So you might want to take note of that. I just want to give you one translation. This is the Holman's Christian Study Bible. And this is what it says. It's on the screen here for you. On that day, he's talking about the flood, all the sources of the watery depths burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened. I think that's a great explanation of what happened. 
One of the best illustrations. This canopy or dome that's surrounded in the sky and protected us from the, the sun and its radiation and all that, it, it broke, and all this water, it explains also where all the water came from. The, the, the grounds burst open. They were under pressure, and the ground, water came up from the ground. And because before the flood, there was no ice uh, polar caps or anything, ice on the earth. It was a you know, nice above freezing temperature everywhere. They formed very quickly, and that's why we have found things like herds of mammoths, these huge elephant-like animals, frozen solid in the northern parts like Siberia of Russia. And inside there, they've actually found them frozen and they've cut their, their stomachs open and found undigested vegetation. So that means that when they were alive, grazing in Siberia, it was like a tragical paradise. But then immediately something changed. They froze solid in just a matter of hours with that undigested tropical uh, vegetation they just eaten. So, what am I saying? This helps me understand where all the water came from for the flood, for one thing, but it also helps me understand why lifespans, as I showed you on my chart, so drastically uh, dropped from 900 something years to, to hundreds of years in just a short time. So my second question then is, I think that answers why Jesus healed so many to give us uh, hope of the future but also the second question is why is there so much sickness and so many diseases when I was a kid I thought you know I knew about heart attacks I knew about cancer and just a few other little things and and then as I got older I heard about all these diseases like MS and and Luke Gehrig's disease and Huntington's disease and I mean there's so many different ways of life life crippling diseases in this world so why is that? Well, I think it's a direct consequence of sin. Illness and all those things come because of it. God protected the world from this, this uh, onslaught of sickness and disease initially with this ferment, this canopy, if you will, that covered the earth. But when every thought of people's hearts was evil continually, the Bible says God destroyed this protective barrier, and that explains this dramatic drop in lifespans. For example, Noah lived to be 950 years. He was 600 years old, the Bible says, when he went into the ark and God shut the door. He lived 350 years into the post-flood uh, time. But his grandson, okay, who was born after the flood, his grandson died at a ripe old age of 428. Less than half, more than half of Noah's age. Just over 300 years after the flood, Abraham, which was like his great, 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 great grandson, lived to be only 100, 175. So you can see this drastic thing I'm talking about. Now, I think the most important reason, though, there's so much sickness and disease in the world is to warn this world of what an eternity would be like in sin. If you die lost and you're in sin and not in Christ, it's just going to be forever a place of pain and suffering. Why do you think God describes, the way he describes hell, this is God's description, is a lake of fire. It's a warning. It's a warning of a place of eternal pain and suffering. But then there's another, word, another warning for you and I who have believed in Jesus because we still go through pain and suffering. And as Christians, we have to endure that pain and suffering. And so God gives us his book of Job to help us understand part of that. If you know about the, the story of Job, uh, he is the most righteous man alive in his day, and the devil didn't like it, and so he pointed him out to, to God and says, you know, if you take away this protection you've got, this hedge of protection around him, then he'll, we'll see what kind of man he really is. So God said, okay, I'll let you do that, but you cannot touch his body. You cannot harm his body, but you can do anything else you want. So he lost his, his family, he lost his crops, he, he lost so many things, and so he didn't lose his faith. So now the devil comes back and says, well, yeah, but you've been protecting him. You let me take his health away from him? You let me do something to his health? He'll show you, he'll, he'll, he'll show you what kind of man he really is. So God says, okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you touch his health, but you cannot kill him. I will not allow you to take his life. So he went out, and this is what the Bible says. The Bible says the devil struck Job with terrible boils from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. Now, I had some kind of blood disorder when I was a teenager, and I had these big boils that would pop out on my, it was just occasional, but it, and they, were, they would hurt so bad, but I just dealt with one at a time, you know, over a period of months and so on. 
But I can't imagine going through having your whole body. It says he took a, a shell to try to scrape. They, they, they hurt so bad. But in all of this, Job did not forsake his faith. And when it's all said and done, this is the lesson that, that God wants us to have from what happened with Job and his own personal pain and suffering. Job came to realize that, he says, in the past, I knew only what others had told me. In other words, he says, you know, in the past, all I knew about you, God, was what I'd heard from other people. But now I have seen you with my own eyes. As I went through all these difficulties and you comforted me and you strengthened me and you gave grace to me and all these other things God does when we go through pain and suffering, he, he learned and he experienced God himself. Now, I must agree with him. In my own personal pain and suffering, I can, I've come to know and love God in a deeper way, realizing that without this pain and suffering, I would not have known these things about who God is. And your pain and suffering, I think, is intended to help you see God with your own eyes. I think that's the purpose of it. So why is there so much? It just comes with the world we live in. But God is there with all these different things we've talked about, his grace, his comfort, his strength. Which brings me to the third and final question I have this morning is, how does God encourage us in the midst of our pain and suffering? Well, first of all, we do have this promise of perfect healing. Can, we, can you imagine today when you have this perfect body who cannot get sick, cannot feel pain? It's, it's, it's amazing to think about it. Now, today I focus primarily on our physical bodies. But Jesus explains his healing is not just for our physical bodies. His healing is also for our soul, body, and spirit. So, since I already mentioned the redemption of the body, let me talk about another verse that uh, refers to this. It's Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, where it says that Christ loved the church and he gave his life for it. And he did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making it clean by washing it in water in order to present the church. Now, we're talking about individuals. That's you or the church. I am the church. We're not about a building. We're talking about people, believers. He said, in order to present people like you to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other imperfection. That's God's plan. God's ultimate plan is that someday in these new glorified bodies, we will be without spot and wrinkle and perfect like Jesus was and Jesus is. That's wonderful, wonderful to think of. When it comes to healing, we have to wait for this perfect healing. But there's still a lot of healing that God can give us even in this life. Just talk about whenever you get over. I, you know, I, uh, I cut myself from time to time. And over three or four days to a week, it heals up, you know. There's a, God's given us an immune system. He's given us a lot of things to cope with, sicknesses and so on in this world, even, this, even today. But here's something to think about. The day that you trusted Jesus, the day that I trusted Jesus, God did a, a miraculous healing of your spirit. The Bible says that that very moment, Jesus came into your heart in a person of the Holy Spirit and that you are now a child of God. Instantly, you, I remember this load of sin, and I was just a young kid, but it felt marvelously inside my body when Jesus forgave me of my sins. That's the first thing, to think about that. But next then, since that day for me, God has begun working on healing my soul. Our souls contain our mind, our will, and emotions, and as our minds are renewed by the Word of God, a transformation has taken place. See, a lot of our emotional imbalance and all the struggles that we have of emotions is caused by ungodly thinking. So when our minds are transformed into thinking godly, we begin to feel peace that surpasses all understanding. Partial healing of our soul can be experienced long before we get to heaven. And I've experienced that, and I hope you've experienced that. Complete healing of souls will take place in heaven. Okay, so our spirit is completely, perfectly healed already. Our soul is being partially healed, and it's going to be completely healed when we get our new bodies. But the bodies, sadly, are, there's not, they, they have to be totally transformed. So our bodies that are wearing down and, and wasting away, we have to have brand new perfect bodies, okay? That's what the Bible teaches us about this. It has to be a complete transformation. 
And in order to understand this work, you need to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, what I want to ask you to do, if you're interested in this, later on today, not right now, I want you to read from about the middle of chapter 15 all the way to the end. It's got like 60-something verses, around 60 verses. Read to about from verse 30 on. You can read even before that if you want, the whole chapter. But I want to just give you a real sampling because of time and try to explain, as Paul tries to explain, this new body. This is what Paul says. This is beginning in verse, uh, verse 35. He says, someone will ask, how can the dead be raised to life? What kind of body will they have? You fool. When you plant a seed in the ground, it does not sprout to life unless it dies. And what you plant is a bare seed, perhaps a grain of wheat or some other grain, not the full-bodied plant that will grow up later. This is how it will be when the dead are raised to life. When the body is buried, it is mortal. When it's raised, it will be immortal. When it's buried, it will be ugly and weak. When raised, it will be beautiful and strong. When buried, it is a physical body. When raised, it will be a spiritual body. I, I used to love when I was a young, I guess, I guess even before as a teenager, planting seeds. You know, I used to love to plant a corn, you know, grain of corn in the ground. And, and sure enough, it would come up in a few days, and it wasn't a corn. It wasn't a corn at all. It was this plant this, with these two little leaves on it. And it would just get bigger and bigger. And then someday it would start having these ears on the side of it. And in those ears, there would be all kinds of grains of corn and to, and when it got to maturity. But you plant the seed, and what comes up is something entirely different. It's not, it's not just a big corn popping out of the ground. It's entire, that's what Paul is using as, a, as an illustration. So where can we find a good illustration of a spiritual body? Well, guess what? Jesus. When Jesus rose to the dead, he had this glorified spiritual body. And in Luke 24, if you want to read that later as well, it describes some of the things about this glorified body that we're going to have these same types of bodies someday as well, like Jesus does. So there's three quick things I want to mention about these spiritual bodies. First of all, it will not be flesh and blood. Not flesh and blood. But it will be flesh and bone. Check it out. Luke 24, 39. Not flesh and blood like we have today, but flesh and bone. In other words, it's still going to have some structure. But right now, as we know, the life is in the blood. And if you bleed out or something, you die. But our new bodies will live forever. We, don't have to, we will have a circulatory system. I don't think we're going to even have a respiratory system. We don't have to breathe, I don't think. Our new bodies are going to be just energized from within and from God. And it'll be dope. But it will still be a physical, spiritual body. Remember when the disciples came up and uh, they see Jesus because everything's been shut up. The doors are sh- locked. The windows are shut. And all of a sudden, Jesus just appears. And they're scared to death of Jesus because they think Jesus is a spirit. So Jesus immediately begins to explain, I'm not a spirit. I'm here. I have a physical body. It's spiritual, yes, but it's physical. It's flesh and bone, he tells them. And he actually encouraged them, come over here and touch me. Come over here and hug me. And they did. In fact, Mary Magdalene had hugged him early that morning, right after he rose from the dead. And remember, she was holding him so tight. He says, Mary, you got to let go. I got to go on to heaven. I got some jobs, some some jobs to do here. And but she was holding a physical body, flesh and bone, very different than our bodies, but still physical. Be able to fit. That, I'm kind of glad about that. That means when I get to heaven, I get my new glorified body. I can go over and give my mother a big bear hug, and my dad a bear bear hug. A physical body, okay? Okay, we don't. Let's not stop there. It's going to be similar, but it's still very different. I don't know what the anatomy is going to be, but it's going to be fantastic because it's going to, it's going to last forever. The second thing that's interesting, I find, is that we'll still be able to eat. Now, that's kind of encouraging to me. I kind of like to eat. I kind of don't like to think that I'm going to be in heaven forever and ever and never taste anything ever again, you know? I won't have to worry about, you know, eating wrong things because there won't be any wrong things in heaven everything we have will be good but we won't eat to sustain our lives they're sustained by the holy spirit and by god in us 
They'll just, it'll just be for enjoyment. Now, Mary and I, we do great most of the time. But last night, we're watching TV and we're eating dinner. And she says, man, I really could go for some ice cream. And I didn't say anything. And she said, can we go, to, can we go get a McFlurry? Man, we shot out of that house and we rode down to McDonald's and I got me a McFlurry. And I don't do that very often, okay? We're, you know, vacations when I usually do that. But man, it was so good. I think they got my flurries in heaven. They just won't have any calories. <laughs> but here, we're going to get to eat. Jesus said, listen, I want to show you something. He said, bring me some honey. So honeycomb, bring me some fish. And they had some broiled fish. And Jesus ate the broiled fish and the honeycomb. So even, we're going to have physical bodies. We're going to be able to eat. But our assistants will be able to 100% consumed. I don't know how it's going to work. It's new anatomy, but it's going to be so cool. Okay, but we're going to be able to eat. That's encouraging to me to taste things, even in heaven. But then there's one thing that's going to take place with our new bodies that's going to be mind-blowing. The Bible says that our new bodies will be able to appear and disappear. Okay? Everything's locked up, and Jesus actually just, I don't know if he demon I don't know how this is going to work. You know, you've seen that Star Trek movies or Star, you know, what, Ward movies, you know. But he just, he was there. Okay? I think that's going to be great. Can you imagine playing hiding and seek? You know? You're about to, or tag, somebody's about to, and you just dematerialize. <laughs> but just think about, this is the things God has got in store for us, folks. A new perfect body, and not, I mean, we all struggle with emotional stuff and, and all kinds of other stuff, and God's going to one day heal it all, and we're going to be perfect and be like Jesus. I wish we could get, you know, experience more of that, but we're right now living in a place that's filled with the effects of sin, and it's difficult sometimes, and it's discouraging sometimes. So we have to hang on to the realize that someday something better is coming, but also every day with Jesus is sweeter than a day before. And we can learn as we accept and follow him to even enjoy a difficult world with a wonderful risen Savior giving us all the needs and meeting our needs in our hearts. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Jesus. And not only was he an example, a Savior of the world, but after he was, uh, had finished the work of salvation and been resurrected, he stayed on this earth and he, he, he taught his disciples, explained things to his disciples. And, and uh, they, they realized that... Uh, that there is life after death and what it will be like in this new spiritual body and gave us an example. We're just touching the tip of the iceberg. We know that there's so many things we cannot even possibly even comprehend about this new perfect body we'll have someday. But God, until that day comes, we need you. We need your grace. We need your strength. We need your comfort. We just need you. We just need you. So God, help us to learn when we're being discouraged to be encouraged by just your very presence. Maybe sometimes it's just by worshiping you. Maybe it's just by reading some scripture. Whatever it is that you can encourage us in the midst of a very discouraging world, that you're there with us. Yea, though we walk through the valley of shadow death, we fear no evil because you are there with us every step of the way. God, help us as we make this journey. And hard as it is, and looking forward to that day when we're going to be like Jesus. As John says, we're not, we don't, right now, it doesn't appear what we shall be. We can't even begin to figure and see and understand. But someday when he comes, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. And when we see him as he is, we will be as him as well. We will be like him. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that precious promise as we seek to continue to serve you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. Oh. Be seated, if you can see, we have the Lord's Supper for the day, third Sunday of July. Deacons, come forward if you would. You know, there's a verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 that Paul says that we do this on a regular basis. Um, 
until Jesus comes back. Y'all be seated if you would. In other words, there's going to come a day, and it could be soon, I'm praying it is, that it'll be the last time. There'll be a day that we'll do this, and then maybe the next week or two or three, Jesus comes, and he takes us to heaven. We're never going to take this again, and never going to do it in heaven, not once. Because here, we've got to be reminded of the cost. It's free. Anybody that comes to Jesus, if they repent of their sins and ask Jesus to come in their heart and save them from their sins, he saves them. It's free. Free gift. But it cost him everything. It cost him his only son. So when we take this, we're reminded that the broken bread represents Christ's broken body. Which is what happened. They didn't understand it then, but we understand it now. Was when Jesus died on the cross. He took your sins and my sins on the cross. And that broke his body. It broke his fellowship with the Father. So that for a little while between, well for eternity really. But for us it seemed like a little while. There was a separation between the Father and his Son. Because God could not look upon our sin. Even though it was on his Son, his loving Son on the cross. And that was a broken body. So he took our sin, put it on the cross, and died for it. But then the cup is, the, it represents the blood, and it represents the fact that life is in the blood. I think this is another reason the new bodies are flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. The purpose of the blood on this earth was for the, to restore and to be a symbolism of life. And so, so Jesus, as, he, as his blood spilt out of his hands and his feet onto the ground, his life was pouring out of him. But it was pouring into us. It was being used. It was going to be used to wash away our sins. So that's what we're doing right now. We're reminded of that. Because we are so forgetful. And these sinful bodies, we can so quickly lose focus. So what God does is he says, I want you to do this on a regular basis. Yes, I want to offer salvation to everybody that comes to me, to Jesus. But it wasn't cheap. It was the most expensive price ever paid. Heavenly Father, thank you that you were willing to give your only son, Jesus, your only begotten son, to save us. Coming down out of heaven, out of glory, being born of the Virgin Mary, living that perfect life, dying on that cross vicariously for the sins of the world, and for all of us who accept what Jesus has done on our behalf and ask him to come into our heart and save us using Jesus' very blood to wash away our sins forever so that someday we'll have these new perfect bodies, flesh and bone, no wrinkle, no spot, perfect in every design. We thank you so much for what Jesus has done, what he's doing, and what he's going to do as we pray this in gratefulness in Jesus' name. Amen. Take
says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then it says, in the same manner, he took the cup. as he took the cup he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me final commentary Paul says for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes see that's what our job is to, to proclaim Jesus has died, buried, risen again to save the world. We've got to keep doing that until Jesus comes to take us to glory. Let's all stand together and I'll close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to gather in this country freely to worship unimpeded, to, to observe the Lord's Supper, to and enjoy the fellowship there is between one another because of what Jesus has done in our hearts. And now to go out and serve and be the light to share Jesus with other people and where we work and live and play, wherever it might be, help us do that until you return to take us to glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.